Hey folks, my name is Kobe Tran, and today we'll be covering the topic of proving some mathematical statement by induction. So, how do we use induction? Well, first, we have to prove our statement for a specific case, and we call this case the base case. Usually, when we induct, we induct on the positive integers, so our base case would be n equals 1. You can make your base case some arbitrary number, like n equals 7, or n equals 45, or whatever. But this usually makes the second part of induction harder, which is the inductive step. This is the main part of proving something by induction. And basically what you do is you assume that the statement is true for some value of n, and using that to prove that it must be true for some other value of n. The most common form of induction uses an inductive step that assumes that the statement is true for n equals k, and then proving the statement for n equals k plus 1. But the inductive step can be a lot of other things, and we're going to be exploring a couple of alternative inductive steps later in the video. Induction is pretty much like knocking over a row of dominoes. The first domino is the one that you have to knock over yourself, and this is like the base case. The inductive step doesn't help you prove it. What the inductive step does help you with is make sure that the rest of the dominoes are close enough together so that if you knock the first domino over, eventually all of the dominoes will fall over. Of course, the positive integers don't have an end, and so the dominoes won't ever stop falling, but the point still stands that any given domino will eventually topple. If you're still confused, don't worry, we've got plenty of examples left to show you. Here, we got the standard introduction problem for induction. We have to prove that the sum of the first n positive integers is equal to n times n plus 1 all over 2. So, how do we start? In all induction proofs, the first step is to prove the statement for a base case. This is usually pretty easy compared to the rest of the proof, since we only have to look at one specific case of the problem. Like I said earlier, we could choose some random integer to be our base case, but let's keep our lives nice and simple and just choose n equals 1. And as we can see, if we plug in n equals 1 to our problem, we get that 1 equals 1 times 2 all over 2. The right hand side evaluates to 1 like we want it to, and so we're done with the base case. Now we can do the actual inductive step. There are a lot of ways to go about this, but the one that is almost always easiest is to use the case of n equals k to prove the case of n equals k plus 1. So we're assuming that the problem is true in the case of n equals k, or that the sum of the first k positive integers is equal to k times k plus 1 all over 2. We have to use that fact in order to show that the problem is true in the case of n equals k plus 1 or that the sum of the first k plus 1 positive integers is equal to k plus 1 times k plus 2 all over 2. Go ahead and pause the video at this point if you want to try it for yourself, but don't worry if you still don't know what to do, because we're going to get there in a second. The first thing to notice is that the sum of the first k plus 1 positive integers is just the sum of the first k positive integers plus k plus 1. This is usually what happens in proofs by induction. You manipulate the problem uh, so that higher cases can be expressed in terms of lower cases. In this case, we could express the case for k plus 1 in terms of the case for k. From here, all you got to do is some algebra to get to what you want. And that's the end of the first proof by induction. Like everything, induction does have its limits. The main issue with this version of induction is that there's no way to induct on uncountable sets. What are uncountable sets? They're basically sets where you can't determine the next element. For example, the integers are a countable set, since, even though they're infinite, there's always a next element that you can point to when given some element of the integers, because you can just sort them and count up by 1. The next element after 7 is 8, then comes 9, 10, 11, etc. But the real numbers are uncountable, because you can't point to whatever the next element is. Between any two distinct real numbers is another distinct real numbers, and you can prove this by writing out the decimal expansions of both reals until they're different. So we can't induct on the real numbers with the technique we have right now. There does exist a version of induction that can work on uncountable sets, but that's too advanced for this video to go deep into. Now we have another problem where we'll do pretty much the same thing. We have to show that the expression n squared plus n plus 1 is odd for all positive integers n. Once again, I'm encouraging you to pause the video, play around with the problem a bit, and see if you can figure out how to prove this with induction. I'm not going to go into as much detail this time, since the solution path is almost identical, and the only thing that's different is the actual proof of the inductive step. Once again, we have a base case of n equals 1, and plugging this into the statement gives us 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3, which is odd, like we want. And we're assuming that k squared plus k plus 1 is odd, 
and using that to prove that k plus 1 squared plus k plus 1 plus 1 is odd. We can express that in terms of the case for k, and since we know that that's odd, and we're adding an even factor to it since 2k plus 2 has a factor of 2, the case for k plus 1 must also hold, or be odd. And we're done. Now, we have a pretty famous theorem here. It's called the AMGM inequality, which stands for arithmetic mean and geometric mean. We have to show that for any n positive real numbers, their arithmetic mean is at least their geometric mean. Notice how we're about to use induction to solve this problem, but it's dealing with real numbers, which as we already said is an uncountable set. That means that we're not going to induct on the numbers themselves, but rather we're going to induct on the number of numbers, or n in this case. This is a pretty difficult proof to come up with if you're just getting started with induction, so I suggest following along for now, but if you want to pause the video and work on it for a bit, then by all means go ahead. This time, our base case is n equals 2. This will make more sense later on in the proof, so don't worry about that yet. It's important to remember that you're not expected to come up with everything necessary for the proof the first time through. In fact, if you're doing that, then that's a sign that you should be doing harder problems. As you do more problems, your intuition for what you need to do to solve a problem gets better, and you'll start seeing patterns that will lead you to think, maybe I should try plugging in this or doing that. Getting back to the problem at hand, we can plug in n equals 2 and get this inequality. And some algebra gets us to the inequality that a square is always at least 0, which is true. So we've proven our base case. Now we have two inductive steps. When we assume that the problem is true for n equals k, we'll prove that it's true for n equals k minus 1 and n equals 2k. Both of these steps are necessary because, from our base case of n equals 2, neither of them alone gets us to all positive integers. If we only prove the inductive step for n equals k minus 1, then we've proven the problem only for n equals 2 and below, which excludes all the positive integers except for 1 and 2. Similarly, if we only prove the inductive step for n equals 2k, then we've proven the problem for only n equals 2, n equals 4, n equals 8, and so on. First, let's take care of the case n equals 2k. Let x be the arithmetic mean of the first k numbers, and y be the arithmetic mean of some other k numbers. Now let w be the geometric mean of the first k numbers, and z be the geometric mean of those other k numbers. Since the arithmetic mean of all 2k numbers is just the arithmetic mean of x and y, and the geometric mean of all 2k numbers is just the geometric mean of w and z, we have to prove that the arithmetic mean of x and y is at least the geometric mean of w and z. By our assumption that AMGM holds for k numbers, we have that x is at least w and y is at least z. Therefore, the arithmetic mean of x and y is at least the arithmetic mean of w and z. Finally, by our base case of n equals 2, the arithmetic mean of w and z is at least the geometric mean of w and z. And we're done with this inductive step. Now let's take care of the case n equals k minus 1. Let the final number be the arithmetic mean of the other k minus 1 numbers. Then the arithmetic mean of all k numbers is equal to the arithmetic mean of those first k minus 1 numbers. If you plug this in, we now have to prove that this, exp this top expression is at least this bottom expression. We can raise both sides to the kth power here and then cancel the factor of the arithmetic mean on both sides. And then if we take the k minus 1th root of both sides, that gives us the AMGM case for n equals k minus 1, like we wanted. And now we've completed both inductive cases, so we're done with the proof, and we've proven AMGM. So to cap this video off, here are some problems that I wanted to talk about, but couldn't due to some time constraints. They're roughly ordered in terms of difficulty, and I highly recommend giving at least some of them a try to solidify your understanding of induction. I hope you all enjoyed watching, and I'll see you next time. Alright, bye.